our next speaker is uh, Francesca Miniasco. Okay, great. So first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers of this event. And as um, Lenka has anticipated, uh, I will talk about analyzing uh, the learning dynamics uh, of uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, using uh, dynamical mean field theory from statistical physics uh, of disordered system. And uh, this is a joint work uh, with uh, Florent Zacala, Per Francesco Urbani, and uh, Lenka. So uh, understanding uh, um, how the stochastic gradient descent uh, algorithm initialized uh, uh, at random uh, is uh, able to achieve a good uh, uh, generalization performance is a central problem in machine learning. And uh, uh, different uh, approaches have been developed to uh, investigate the dynamics uh, of this algorithm. So in some uh, specific cases, uh, um, the whole trajectory of the algorithm uh, can be tracked uh, analytically. And these cases uh, are um, linear networks uh, trained uh, with the gradient descent or uh, the one pass uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithm where at each iteration, uh, the gradient is computed on a new sample that has uh, never been seen before. And uh, also in the case of two layer networks uh, with a diverging number of uh, hidden units. Uh, however, in uh, practical applications, uh, the training samples uh, are reused uh, multiple times. And this can lead to a large uh, generalization gap that cannot be studied if one considers uh, uh, the online learning setting. So in, uh, um, in this paper, we considered instead the multi-pass uh, um, stochastic gradient descent algorithm uh, trained with the generic loss that can be non-convex in uh, high dimensions. And we derive a set of equations that uh, can track uh, these dynamics. So we uh, consider uh, a problem of supervised uh, binary classification where the input data are n vectors in uh, dimension D. And um, we model uh, the data as uh, um, generated from a mixture of uh, Gaussians where the centers of the Gaussian clusters are defined uh, by this uh, vector uh, V star and the coefficients uh, C mu. And uh, we consider uh, the noisy regime where the variance of the noise uh, delta is such that uh, um, even if one knew exactly uh, the centers of the Gaussian clouds, uh, one would still make a finite fraction of mistakes. Uh, we study two variants uh, of this model, one that is linearly separable with just uh, uh, two Gaussian clusters. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the network is simply a threshold linear uh, classifier. And we consider also a non-linearly separable case um, where we have uh, uh, three uh, Gaussian clusters. And uh, um, again, we have a single layer, but with a, a door activation function. So the labels can be uh, either plus one and minus one uh, for the left and right cluster in the linearly separable case. And in a non-linearly separable case, we take uh, um, the two external clusters with the same label and the central cluster with an opposite label. We consider um, the limit of uh, infinite number of samples and infinite uh, dimensions keeping a fixed the ratio uh, alpha, that is a control uh, parameter that we'll, uh, we will keep uh, of order one. So uh, the training algorithm uh, is uh, the following. So we learn uh, the training vector uh, through the empirical risk minimization of this loss function L. Uh, so we have a loss function uh, summed over all the samples and a ridge regularization term. So this is uh, um, at variance with the, the model that Lenka explained, uh, the spherical p-spin, where we had a spherical constraint. In this case, the regularization uh, is there, but is uh, a fixed uh, parameter that be, can be tuned by cross-validation. And uh, at each uh, discrete time step, the gradient is computed uh, not on the full batch, but uh, on a random subset, on a random mini batch. And this uh, mini batch is uh, selected by the binary variables S mu. Uh, 
uh, that are time dependent. So uh, in practice, as mu is equal to one if the sample mu is used to compute the gradient, and it's at zero uh, otherwise. Our analysis uh, um, requires to take the continuous time limit of uh, this weight update. Uh, therefore, we need to define uh, um, a stochastic process for these uh, binary variables uh, as mu um, that, uh, in such a way that uh, this continuous time limit uh, is uh, well defined. And uh, so to this uh, end, we introduced uh, a variant of the uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, algorithm that we call uh, uh, persistent uh, stochastic gradient descent, where at uh, each time, um, as uh, in the SGD, usual SGD algorithm, we fix uh, a fraction of samples that are used uh, to compute the gradient. Uh, and uh, at variance uh, with the usual SGD uh, algorithm, um, each sample stays in the training mini batch for a, a characteristic time uh, tau. So with this definition, we can write the update in a continuous time. And we, and we call this equation a stochastic gradient flow. So to track uh, the dynamics uh, of the weight vector, uh, we use uh, a dynamical mean field theory from statistical physics. In uh, particular, uh, we generalize uh, the result uh, of uh, Agorizas, uh, uh, Biroli, Urbani, and Zamponi of 2018. Uh, they, they studied uh, uh, the perceptron with random uh, uh, inputs, and uh, we extend this result to include uh, the stochasticity of the gradient and uh, uh, the structure in the data that allows uh, uh, to study the generalization gap. So I will uh, not go into the details uh, uh, of the computation, uh, but in summary, uh, what dynamical mean field theory allows to do is to perform a dimensional reduction from uh, the stochastic gradient flow, so a dynamics uh, of an infinite number of variables uh, that are uh, strongly correlated to the evolution of just uh, one uh, degree of freedom at the price uh, of adding memory to the dynamics. So the result uh, looks like this. Um, it's a set of integral differential equations uh, that depend on uh, memory kernels and auxiliary functions, and therefore it must be solved in a self-consistent way. Uh, in particular, we obtain that uh, the relevant information that we use uh, to characterize uh, the learning performance of the algorithm is encoded uh, in uh, an ODE, uh, for uh, M, that is the, the alignment of the weight vector with the signal, so in this case uh, with the center uh, V star of the Gaussian clouds. And uh, also uh, the performance is characterized by an effective stochastic process for this uh, uh, variable HT, uh, where HT is uh, related um, to the projection of the weights, uh, this time on the noise uh, of, uh, of each sample. Uh, so we find uh, that uh, um, this effective uh, stochastic, uh, um, this effective degree of freedom is, uh, um, is regularized and the strength of regularization is uh, increased by a self-induced uh, term that would be always present even if the ridge regularization was set to zero. Uh, then we obtain a term that accounts uh, for the effective uh, stochastic gradient and uh, a memory term. And uh, we have different sources of uh, uh, noise in the dynamics. Uh, so it, was, uh, it is uh, different from what we would obtain with uh, a Langevin algorithm. And uh, so we have a random initial condition, uh, the stochasticity of the gradient, and that, uh, and the, this is in particular the difference with the, the Langevin algorithm. And uh, we also have that uh, the process has a Gaussian effective noise. So in practice, uh, the MFT allows uh, uh, to characterize uh, all the quantities uh, that we use to define the performance in terms uh, of these uh, scalar uh, variables, uh, HT and the M of T. Uh, so the training loss, uh, the uh, training uh, accuracy and the generalization error that uh, we define 
as the fraction of misclassified samples. Uh, so we can derive uh, analytic expression, uh, expressions for all of these uh, uh, quantities. And now I will uh, um, show some results. Uh, um, I didn't mention that uh, our analysis holds uh, for a generic loss function. Uh, but, uh, but then in these plots, uh, uh, I use the, uh, the logistic loss. So first we see that dynamical mean field theory is able to track uh, the full trajectory of the generalization error. And uh, here I'm plotting the generalization as a function of training time and the training accuracy. And uh, uh, we see a good agreement with simulations that are done at the finite dimensions. So we have dimension ranging from 500 to 10,000. And we also observe that uh, a small uh, batch size has the effect to shift the early stopping minimum of the generalization error at uh, higher times. And uh, in the, this time window that we considered, uh, a small batch size improves uh, the generalization performance. Another thing that we observe is that the small batch size acts as an effective regularization. So if we look at the weight norm as a function of time, we see that decreasing uh, the batch size has a similar effect than increasing the strength of the rich regularization. And finally, uh, if we look at this, uh, at the comparison between our variant of SGD algorithm compared to the standard SGD. So if we look at persistent SGD, at uh, different characteristic time tau, we see that the generalization error approaches uh, the one of stochastic gradient descent uh, when the characteristic time goes to zero. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, um, the MFP provides uh, the analytical tool to track the trajectory of a stochastic gradient descent algorithm in high dimensions. And there are some uh, future directions that we're uh, interested in investigating. Uh, so first of all, um, using the MFT uh, to gain uh, more in insights uh, about uh, uh, the performance of the algorithm. So what we can say about the optimal uh, um, hyperparameter tuning and uh, uh, what can we say about the nature of the noise that is introduced uh, by the SGD algorithm. Uh, then we are also working on extending this uh, derivation to other uh, data structures and to uh, different architectures uh, with uh, one hidden unit. And uh, we would also like to consider different variants uh, of the training algorithm, for instance, uh, um, SGD with the momentum. And uh, uh, finally, um, for the mathematical community, a uh, very interesting result would be uh, the rigorous proof of this equation, as Lenka mentioned, uh, that, we, that uh, was already done in the case of the P-spin model. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Francesca, for that wonderful talk. It was super interesting. There are a few questions from the Q&A. Okay. Um, the the first one is from Amber, um, and the question is: the persistent assumption seems a little non-standard. Could you comment on how the results vary as tau goes to infinity? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't. Uh... The, the persistence assumption, which is that the elements persist in subsequent batches, is uh, currently uh, non non-standard and. Uh, could you comment on how the results vary as tau goes to infinity? Okay, ah, so the uh, actually the limit of tau uh, goes to infinity. Uh, I'm just going back to the definition. Um, I wouldn't consider that, the, uh, I mean, the, the more interesting side is the tau going to zero because in that case, we have that each pattern uh, spends uh, a, a time, uh, a zero time in the training batch. And so it's really close to the SGD algorithm where at each time, uh, the, the mini, at each iteration step, the uh, mini batch is uh, drawn from scratch. The infinite uh, persistence time limit would uh, correspond basically to a gradient descent on a subset of the, of the training set. So it would, uh, it would, 
uh, correspond to just uh, select a mini batch and then freeze the optimization and consider just that mini batch uh, for uh, all the training. So it would uh, basically change uh, the parameter alpha here, but it's uh, it would lead to it's it's not. Uh, in, in this sense that we define the algorithm, but more uh, in the sense of considering then the limit uh, of tau that goes to zero. Okay, the, the next question is from Sven, uh, and I kind of had a similar version of this question, and he's interested in asking, how do you solve the, how do you solve the DMF equations in the closed yes. form, basically with the self-consistent memory term? Yes, okay, uh, because this maybe, um, I didn't mention uh, this, but the equations that uh, Lenka showed uh, have, have a difference with this one, because in that case, in that case, the model is not bipartite. Well, in this case, uh, it is. Uh, so uh, in that case, the equations can, um, can be closed and you don't need this uh, self-consistent loop. While in this case, we have all these uh, uh, memory kernels and auxiliary functions that we initialize at uh, random. Then we, uh, we proceed by iteration. So we plug this uh, uh, initialization in the equations, in the equation for the self-consistent stochastic process. And we get an update. Then we use this update to compute again all the uh, memory kernel and auxiliary function. We, uh, I didn't mention, but these averages are over many realizations of the stochastic uh, process. So we have to uh, generate uh, See, uh, many cores. Yes. Okay. And then we have to plug them and uh, iterate until uh, we set the criteria. And I don't know, we look at the Frobenius norm of the, of the difference between the two iterations and we see when it goes constant. Um, thank you. And one more question from Mohammed, um, which is, um, where the self-induced regularization is coming from and why does it even remain in the full batch setup? Okay. Uh, so this uh, uh, self-induced regularization comes from the uh, DMSP computation. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, um, I mean, it would uh, correspond to a self-energy uh, term uh, and uh, it comes uh, uh, from, well, basically what we do in the, I mean, it's not uh, something that I can uh, uh, explain uh, quickly, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, because it's not at all, the, uh, it doesn't come from the, um, from the regularization. It's just a term that appears that uh, is uh, uh, proportional to H of T and uh, in the same way as the, the regularization. But it would be there even if we used uh, no regularization or a different kind, for, for example, LASTO. Okay. Um, I had a question which was maybe slightly tangential and I was trying to relate this work to um, the work of Suyin Chung and Heim Polinsky, where they're talking about um, randomly labeling high dimensional uh, manifolds and drawing hyperplanes to classify them. And um, they had some statements to make when this problem is hard or easy, depending on the geometry of the objects which are labeled. Um, so in your case, like when the Gaussian mixtures, if, if you, make some assumptions about the covariance. Is there something interesting to say how the geometry or the alignment would uh, play into this? Um, okay, yes, for the uh, two cluster case, for the, for the case of the two Gaussians, uh, yeah. we, have, uh, um, uh, we have a paper on uh, ICML this year where we studied the, the static of the problem, so the asymptotic solution and how it varies as a, a function of the of the fraction of samples over dimension alpha, and we uh, so as the, and also uh, as the different proportion of uh, points uh, in one or the other clusters, so we can derive uh, um, a phase transition uh, 
uh, so we have a phase diagram and we can uh, see where the problem for which alpha we have a phase transition from perfect linear separability to uh, where the clusters are not linearly separable anymore. So in that case, we have, yes. So and Gaussians with the same volume, but one is long versus one is blobby. Um, now in this case, we just tune the uh, the variance uh, of the clusters with the same uh, with the same uh, uh, same variance, the isotropic, and we just tune the the um, the variance parameter and the relative number of points in one or the other clusters, and we derive the phase diagram. I see. Okay. Um. I think there are no more questions unless some panelists have uh, questions to ask. I, I wanted to um, learn a, a little bit more about the uh, the persistent SGT. It seemed to me that uh, from the plot uh, of performance, uh, particularly the generalization error, uh, classical SGD was closer to the bias optimal than the persistent yes. SGD. And yes, so, um, in, so I'm curious as to what what is the the significance of the analysis of persistent SGD? What what do I gain by by doing it in a persistent manner? Well, uh, I mean, I cannot analyze directly the SGD algorithm because it's not well defined in the continuous time limit. So that's why I I use the persistent uh, version instead. But I can still uh, uh, study persistent SGD with small uh, characteristic time to see how the finite uh, uh, mini batch helps generalization by adding some noise. And uh, for instance, uh, considering more complicated problem with uh, more minima, how this noise helps to go to better generalizing minima. So it's uh, it's still very different from doing GD and. Uh, It's the, it's the closest version of the of the SGD that we could uh, study. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, um, thank you, Francesca, again for a really interesting talk. And um, what be the next speaker, uh, Simon? Could, could not make it. So we are gonna have an early break. Um, and so we encourage all of you to go to gather to carry on more informal discussions. And just to remind um, you about something which was said before, the posters are still up and there are many rooms in gather where you can um, go and interact on a more informal basis about both the talks and other stuff. And if you're interested in seeing the posters, so you can head to the poster rooms um the speakers may not be there but you can take a look at the poster so i encourage all of you to go back to the posters and we'll be back here at um 12 20 eastern time in the united states so i thank again all the panelists for being online and we'll see you again soon <laughs>